the surprise attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. The reason they attacked Pearl Harbor was because so many, a large part of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was at anchor in Pearl Harbor at the time in the attack. And as you know, most of those ships were sunk. So in one, in a matter of hours, the U.S. lost part of its Pacific Fleet. One month later, January 6, 1942, President Roosevelt gave his State of the Union address in which he laid out arms production goals for the United States. He said, we're going to produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, at least a few thousand ships. And the public response was very skeptical. We were still in a depression mode economy at the time, and people simply could not imagine the enormous production effort it would take to reach these goals. But what President Roosevelt and his colleagues realized at that time was that the largest concentration of industrial power in the world was in the U.S. automobile industry. Because even during the Depression years of the 1930s, we were producing two or three million cars a year. So after his State of the Union address, when he laid out the arms production goals, he called in the leaders of the automobile industry. And he said, because you represent such a large share of our national industrial capacity, we're going to rely heavily on you to help us reach these arms production goals. And they said, well, Mr. President, we're going to do everything we can, but it's, it's, going, to be a, it's going to be difficult producing cars and all these arms too. He said, you don't understand. We're going to ban the sale of automobiles in the United States. And that's, that's exactly what happened from the beginning of April 1942 until the end of 1944, there were essentially no cars produced in the United States. And we exceeded every one of those arms production goals. We didn't produce 60,000 planes, we produced 129,000 planes. Fighter, fighters, bombers, troop transports, cargo transports, reconnaissance planes. I was on a book tour in the United States uh, a few months ago and was in Seattle, Washington, where Boeing's major production facilities are located. And I was thinking, I mean, even today, trying to think of how to produce 129,000 planes is challenging. But we did it. We did it 60 years ago. So, the point of this example is that it did not take decades to restructure the U.S. industrial economy. It did not take years. We did it in a matter of months. And so when I look at the need to restructure the world energy economy in order to stabilize climate over the next decade, I think it's entirely possible. I mean, for example, a million and a half wind turbines two megawatts each would enable us to back out all the world's coal-fired power plants. A million and a half wind turbines sounds like a lot. It is a lot. But we produce 65 million cars every year. And in the United States, we have several automobile assembly plants that are idled. We can produce wind turbines on assembly lines if we choose to. Just as in World War II, we produced bombers on automobile assembly lines in, in Detroit. So it's doable if it becomes important for us to do so. It is time, I think, to redefine security. For so long now, in the last century, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, we came to think of security in military terms. But most of the threats that the world is facing today cannot be solved by the military. The threats to our future security come from 
climate change, from population growth, from falling water tables, from tightening food supplies. These are the real threats to our security now. And if we look at the global military budget that's now over a trillion dollars, we can see how to convert even part of that, a fifth of that, would take care of doing many of the things we need to do with reforestation, soil conservation, family planning, eradicating poverty. And we work out the budget in, in Plan B 4.0. For a long time now, many of us, quite a few of us in this room, have been talking about the need to save the planet. I've, I've concluded that the planet's going to be around for some time. What's at stake now is civilization. And saving civilization is not a spectator sport. We all have a stake in the future of civilization as individuals, as parents, for some of us as grandparents. And the future of civilization is, is now what it's all about. And it's going to take an enormous effort in a short period of time. And when people ask me, what can I do? I think they expect me to say, recycle your newspapers and change your light bulbs. And those are important. But we now have to change the system. We've got to restructure the world economy. We have to do it quickly. That means building wind farms and solar thermal power plants and replacing light bulbs and closing coal-fired power plants. It's doable. We can do it. Pick an issue that's important to you. Is it closing coal-fired power plants? Is it stabilizing world population? Is it developing a world-class recycling program in your community which greatly reduces energy use? Pick an issue that's important to you. Talk with some friends and see what, what they're interested in and organize. I talked about the movement to ban new coal plants in the US and to start closing existing ones. This doesn't involve millions of people. It involves a few thousand people, well organized at the grassroots level with a clearly defined goal and the capacity to translate that goal into reality. It doesn't take a majority of the 300 million people in the United States to close coal-fired power plants. It, it, it takes just a few thousand organized people in communities across the country to do it. So it's doable, but we've all got to, we all have to get involved. I, I want to thank you all for coming out. We now can turn to questions and some of the other things, but thanks so much for, for coming out tonight. Grazie a Lester Brown, grazie anche al pubblico che sta producendo una quantità di domande, io chiaramente dovrò scegliere, eh, comunque lo farò dopo gli interventi, il primo dei quali è di Luigi Bistagnino, docente di disegno industriale al Politecnico di Torino, che si occupa in particolare di design sistemico, ovvero della progettazione delle filiere eh, industriali con l'obiettivo di ridurne l'impatto ambientale, in qualche modo l'impronta energetica.